I'm Steve. Welcome to This New Life. Today, Pastor Paul is going to be continuing the series on tithes and offerings as it pertains to the heart of our church and where we came from. So I really hope you enjoy it and be blessed. I'm wanting to continue to lay a foundation. I don't know if you've been near Town Center, but the front of Town Center or anytime you see a construction site, they usually wall it off. They put up a, a metal walling and they begin to dig and then dig deep. And when they dig deep, they, they are laying a foundation. And uh, when you lay the foundation, you dig deep, and then you pour a lot of steel and a lot of cement into your foundation. And uh, then you cover it up. This building has a very deep foundation. I mean, this church is uh, built on a solid foundation, not just because it's built on the Lord Jesus Christ, but the foundation under this physical building is mostly rock. So uh, the spiritual house and this physical house are based, uh, built on the rock, uh, which took a lot of time to dig. It took a lot of effort and a lot of extra money. There's a lot of steel. And how many of you know you don't come invite people to come look at your pretty foundation? No, because usually it's a hole in the ground. And, but the, the depth and the strength of your foundation determines the stability of your house. And so as we're taking the time to talk about giving and tithes and offerings, it's part of the foundation of, of what we believe and why we do what we do to bring a peace and an awareness and a revelation. I shared this before. It takes revelation to enjoy giving. I mean, it doesn't take any revelation to enjoy receiving. But it takes more of a revelation to enjoy giving. And so we want to try to answer some questions and, and, and build a, a, a solid foundation of why we do what we do and also establish solid doctrine. Because as we talk about tithes and offerings, uh, the word tithe means tenth. And, and most people, when they think of the word tithe, they think of something that was required under the law. And that's why I wanted to take the time to start with Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob because they were there before the law ever came. The law came by Moses. But before the tithing, uh, before we ever had the law, we saw men that would tithe. And, and, I, and I, what I'm wanting to do is affect your thinking so when you think of tithing, you don't think of something le legally demanded, but you, you take the word tithe and it, and it connects to the word honor. So there's a difference between and in something that's forced and expected and demanded and commanded versus something that comes out of the heart. Honor, you, you, you can't demand honor. You can demand respect. I mean, you can demand obedience. I mean, as your kids are growing up, you can tell them you must obey and you can force them to obey to a certain extent. Now, when they get older, you can't control them. And so... We're hoping that our instruction and, and, and teaching them when they're younger, that as they get older, when we cannot control them, because we can't control them, they will do what's right because they believe it's right, not because they're forced. And see, that's what the law was trying to do. But tithing was before the law. Tithing is about honor. Now, I talked about Abraham tithe, Isaac, Jacob. Now, I want to go back even further than these guys. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, now the translation says, if you do things rightly, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, if you don't do things rightly, Sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. If you do things well, if you do things rightly, 
you'll be accepted. All will be well. It's okay. But if you don't do things well and if you don't do it right, then sin is at your door to rule over you, but it should not rule over you. You should rule over it. So basically, God is saying, look, come on, let's have a little attitude adjustment. Let's get it right so it's well with you, so sin doesn't rule over you. You rule over it. And then we go to the next verse. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. How many of you believe that between verse 7 and verse 8, Cain did not adjust his attitude? God's trying to say, hey, there's a problem here with your heart. See, when they came before the Lord with their offering, many people, I've heard people say this, well, you know, the reason that God did not receive Cain's offering is because it was of the fruit of the ground and God only receives offerings of a sacrifice of animals. Well, that's not true. Because even under the law, even later on, what they are, uh, when you bring your tithes and your offerings into the, to the storehouse or to the house of the Lord or even to the priest, you bring grain offerings, you bring your new oil, you bring your new wine, you bring your first fruits. Uh, there was all kinds of offerings. It wasn't just the first of your flock. What it was was your first and your best. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. In other words, he brought the best that he had. Cain just brought something. Now, if, you, if your finger goes inside the papaya because it's all old and it's overripe, is that a good fruit to bring as a gift? Is that your best fruit? Is that your first fruit? No, that's your old fruit. And see, and that's the issue here, is Abel brought his best. Cain did not. It doesn't matter if it's fruits. It doesn't matter if it's vegetables. If you're, it doesn't matter if you're going to bring bananas. But if you're going to give your bananas to the Lord, don't bring him the ones that are all brown and flies are circling in your kitchen. Come on, how many of you had bananas that you didn't eat quick enough and they started turning brown? And then when you begin to peel them, the insides are kind of brown and it looks like someone kind of stepped on it. Is it an honor? If you have a guest coming in, are you going to give that to your guest? They're going to look at that and go. So if you wouldn't give it to a guest, would you bring that as an offering to honor God? So Cain comes, and even though he's a tiller of the ground, that's okay. But he didn't bring his best. And when we begin to hold back our best, now I want you to also think about this. It says in the process of time. Verse 3, it's already in the process of time. How much time is that? Verse 1, one baby. Verse 2, two babies. Verse 3, in the process of time. Cain brought an offer. He's a tiller of the ground. I don't think he's four years old. Or five years old or six years I don't think we have six-year-olds out there working the ground and bringing in their harvest to the Lord how old do you think Cain is I'm sure he's at least a teenager how many brothers and sisters does he have by now see I'm trying to get you to expand when you read the Bible slow down and think a little bit because if verse 1 is one baby verse 2 is two babies in the process of time Cain is already at least a teenager or a young man I'm sure besides just Cain and Abel he's got a lot of other brothers and a lot of other sisters already he's a young man and he comes and he's bringing his offering to the Lord. Why is he bringing his offering to the Lord? We're only in chapter 4 of Genesis, still in the beginning. Obviously, his father has taught him and his brother, listen, we honor the Creator. We, we bless God. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's the creator of all things. Listen, he made me. Can you imagine Adam, the first man, the first father, speaking to his sons of creation, the beauty of creation, explaining to them, he goes, listen, God took of the dust of, of the earth, the dirt of the earth, and he fashioned and he molded me, and he breathed into me the breath of life, and I became a living being. 
I named every animal. Boys, every animal that you see, I named them. And God let me name them before he brought your mother along so we would have no arguments. I named every animal, everything that you see, every animal, every bird that you see. The be- Can you imagine how beautiful the earth was? Not just the earth, but the garden that was created especially for them. Because you see, God made all of creation, then he made man, and after he made man, then he made the garden. Adam was there before God made a garden special and then brought Adam into this special place. Can you imagine Adam telling his sons this? And then, boys, one day, God put me to sleep. And he took one of my ribs. And when I woke up, there was your mom. Wow. And next thing we know, you guys came along. Can you imagine the first man talking about the Creator? How in the beginning we walked with God in the cool of the evening. We fellowship with God. The first man talking to his first two born sons of honoring the Creator of all things, of heaven and earth. What it was like for Adam. And now we don't know, listen, when you read Genesis, first of all, don't think that Adam and Eve were in the garden, and the next thing you know, they're out of the garden. We don't know how many years. Because if verse 1 is a baby, verse 2 is a baby, and then verse 3, in the process of time, they're bringing offerings, we don't know how many years Adam and Eve truly enjoyed the beauty of God's, the Garden of Eden. The story that Adam is able to tell his sons And so we see in Genesis chapter 4, what do we see? We see his sons doing what? Bringing an offering to God. There is no law, but they're coming to honor. And why was one offering received? Because it was the first and the best of what he had. That didn't come from the law. The law doesn't come for thousands of years later. That came from the very first man, the very first father, teaching his sons, listen, We honor God with what comes into our life. Why? It will protect us. Think about the first son who refused to honor God with his best, affected the way he treated his own flesh and blood. Because when you don't honor God, and this relationship gets affected because you're not willing to take of what you have and share with him you're not willing to give him the best you have listen if you won't give God your best you will never give a person your best you will want to hold on to what you have and 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 you what will happen is you will become coveting and you will become greedy and you will become selfish and then you will get jealous You will become envious, and it will affect your relationship with other people to the point that because Cain was not willing to get his attitude right between him and God, that he already had an issue of having to give God my best and honor him. and I want it for me. And what happened is Abel received something from God that Cain didn't get. His offering was was accepted. You see, Abel honored God, and God honored Abel. And already, that means that Abel is getting something that Cain doesn't have. And he, not only out of his covetousness, now he's resentful because his brother now is getting this honor from God and the respect of his offering that Cain didn't get. And now we have resentment. What would have protected all of this? if Cain just honored God. What I want you to see is God is not trying to control you. He's not trying to dominate you. He's not trying to take anything from you. But God knows the heart of man. And he's wanting to teach man, look, if you'll honor me, it will do something to protect you and to preserve you, and it will secure you not only in your relationship with me, but it will secure you in your relationship with other people. 
That's all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, this is Solomon here. Now, yes, this is while the children of Israel are now under the law. But I want you to understand that honor always was before the law, during the law, and continues after the law. Honor is never limited by law. Law is demanding an outward action. Honor is something God is wanting to bring forth from the heart. Amen? Honor the Lord with your possessions. Come on, everybody say possessions. That's what you possess. See, if you are possessed, that means you're controlled by something. God doesn't want you possessed or controlled by anything. I mean, in fact, God doesn't want you possessed or controlled by anything to the point that he gave you a free will that not even God will control you. Think about that. Does God want to control man? No. Honor the Lord with your possessions. In other words, you possess it, you control it, it does not control you. God doesn't want you controlled by anything or anyone, not even himself. We choose to follow him. If anyone does, Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, why do we follow him? Desire. What is God wanting to build in our life? To go way beyond the have to to the want to. It's out of desire that we do what we do, not law. Our giving should never be out of law. Your tithing is not out of law. What are we wanting to do? Well, I want to honor God with my possessions. I want to take the things that I possess in life because when I can honor God with the things that I possess, then the things that I have will never possess me or control me. You see, honoring God protects you from greed and covetousness. Amen. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. As increase comes in, Lord, I, I, I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life. From the very beginning, Cain and Abel, first two sons of creation, they came. One honored God with the first fruits of his increase. The other one said, you know what? I don't want to. And it developed and it digressed from there. It's a choice that we have. It's not a law. It's not legalism. It's an opportunity that we have to honor God. What will he do? He said, I'll fill your barns with plenty and your vats will overflow with new life, new wine. As you honor me, I'm really going to bless you. What I want you to see is honor towards God is all about protection and provision in your life. Amen. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God is speaking to the children of Israel before they come back to the promised land. Now understand, the children of Israel have come to the promised land. They, they were there 40 years earlier. They were supposed to go in. God told them to go in. They sent spies. They sent 12 spies into the promised land. They were there for 40 days. They came back. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, it's a good land. Let's go in. Let's, let's get the land. The 10 other spies... Anybody know the names of the 10 other spies that had a bad report? No. You know why? Nobody cares. Palti, Sether, Nabi. Please, don't name your kids Nabi, okay? These, Sether. These, Egal, not Eagle, Egal. These are some of the names of the ten spies who came back with an evil report. And they convinced the children of Israel, and they were very fearful, and they would not follow God. And so God said, fine, you don't want to go in, you don't want to obey me. Okay, for every year that you, every day you spied out the promised land, that's a year in the wilderness. You don't want to go in, you don't want to listen, you don't want to obey, you don't trust me. Fine, wander. So they went out into the wilderness. And everybody 20 years old and above died in the wilderness. Forty years later, 
They're coming back to the promised land. Joshua. The book of Joshua, they're back. Joshua is back at a place that he was at 40 years before. Joshua is back. Caleb is back. All the other 10, they're buried in the wilderness. I don't want to be buried in the wilderness. I want to go in what God has for me. So Joshua, they're getting ready to come into the promised land. But in Deuteronomy, it's the book right before they get back to the promised land. And this is what God is saying to them, Deuteronomy chapter 8. One of the things he says to them, he says, look, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you. So when you've eaten and you're full, you've built beautiful houses and you dwell in them. When your herds and your flocks multiply, your gold and your silver are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. Then your heart is lifted up and you forget about the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, brought you out of bondage, brought you through all these times in the wilderness. Verse 17, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand, my diligence, my hard work, my planning, my talent, my good looks have got me all this wealth. You shall remember that the Lord your God, it is he who gives you power to get wealth. In other words, he's saying, listen, when you come into this land, that's going to be a beautiful land. He said that a land full of olive oil and honey and land which you will eat bread without scarcity. It says you will lack nothing. When you come into this land, everything is taken care of and provided. It's your inheritance. When you get in there, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget who brought you out, brought you in, and all the provision don't forget. What causes us not to forget honor? First two sons of creation. What was their dad trying to teach them? Don't forget. Don't forget who made it all. Don't forget who created it all. Don't forget who breathed into me. Here's the first man talking to the firstborn son saying, he breathed into me the breath of life. The breath of man comes from the creator. Boys, don't forget that. Don't forget that whatever it is that you do, whatever skills, whatever intelligence, whatever education, whatever opportunities, whatever it is, don't forget God in your life. Honor Him. To listen to the whole message and to learn more about New Life and its ministries, visit newlife.ph. If you have a testimony you'd like to share or a prayer request, email newlife at newlife.ph.